Canada is a large country, stretching from Atlantic to Pacific. Trains have connected the east and west ends of the country for over a century. Modern buses, subways, and light rail systems have also sprung up in recent years to move people around within urban centers. But how did we get here? How have Canada's trains grown and declined? Will they make a comeback? Let's find out! Railways in Canada have existed since the British North America era, even before Confederation. The first true railway in Canada was the Champlain and St. Lawrence Railroad. It was located in Quebec, and it ran between La Prairie on the St. Lawrence River and Saint-Jean-sur-Richelieu on the Richelieu River. It opened on July 21st, 1836. Throughout the years, several railways sprung up through British North America, such as the Albion Mines Railway, the first railway in the Maritimes, which opened on September 19th, 1839, the St. Lawrence and Atlantic Railroad, which connected Montreal to Portland, Maine, and the Atlantic Ocean, and the Great Western Railway, which connected Niagara Falls to Windsor. A major railway built during this time was the Grand Trunk Railway. It originally connected Toronto, Montreal, and the St. Lawrence Corridor, but was expanding to be the longest railway at the time of Canadian Confederation. It was later merged into the Canadian National Railway. The many railways that sprung up brought the economies of the towns and cities that they connected to life. Many new towns were established around railway lines. They transported goods and raw materials around the country and gave rise to industrialization. Perhaps one of the most significant railways built in Canada was the Canadian Pacific Railway. Confederation took place in 1867. Prime Minister Sir John A. Macdonald wanted Canada to stretch from coast to coast. To accomplish this, the government convinced British Columbia to join Canada with the promise of a railway being built within 10 years. Construction of the CPR began in 1881. To build a 3,200 kilometer railway, it took 30,000 workers four and a half years, and it was a difficult task, as they would have to blast their way through mountains and build trestles over deep ravines. Additionally, around 15,000 Chinese workers were hired. They were paid less in comparison to the white workers. The Chinese workers were paid $1 a day, compared to the white workers, who were paid $150 to $250 a day, and they were given more dangerous jobs. Now, pour it in the hole gently, understand? Any little bump and that stuff will blow- Damn it, that's the third one we lost this month. By the time the railway was completed, many of them did not have the money to return to China. The Northwest Rebellion also took place during the time the CPR was being built, because the Métis felt that Canada was not protecting their rights, their land, and their survival as a distinct people. The rebellion lasted five months, and ultimately led to the hanging of the Métis leader, Louis Riel. After many laborious years of construction, the last spike was finally driven on November 7, 1885, at Craigalachie, British Columbia by company director Donald Smith. The Canadian Pacific Railway connected east and west and brought both ends of Canada together as a whole. Railway facilities built during this time were lavishly designed, and rail companies even offered accompanying services such as telegraph services and hotels. Here in downtown Toronto, you can find the opulently designed Union Station, which is actually Toronto's third Union Station. It was constructed between 1914 and 1920 by the Toronto Terminals Railway, which was jointly owned by the two major railway companies at the time, the Grand Trunk Railway and Canadian Pacific Railway. Inside its large Great Hall, you can admire the light shining in through the windows into the massive hall, and you can see many town names inscribed along the walls of the hall, which were accessible by train at the time the station was built. Across the street, you'll find the Royal York Hotel, which was originally built by the Canadian Pacific Railway. There were once many luxury hotels operated by railway companies across Canada. 
Another famous example is the Chateau Frontenac in Quebec City. Following World War II, intercity rail travel declined significantly. This is due to the fact that the provincial and federal governments had heavily invested in the construction of the road and highway network and had virtually abandoned the passenger rail network. Highways stretched across the country. The federal government also promoted the development of air transport with subsidies to aircraft manufacturers, the construction of airports, and generous subsidies to commercial airline operators. Passenger transport on the Canadian National Railway and Canadian Pacific Railway, the two passenger rail operators at the time, was becoming increasingly unprofitable and they desired to abandon their services, but the federal government forced them to maintain minimal service on their lines. However, freight transport remained profitable. The problems with passenger rail were so significant that Prime Minister Pierre Elliott Trudeau promised to create a nationalized rail service similar to Amtrak in the United States. In 1976, CN adopted the Via Rail branding for its passenger rail service. One year later, on January 12, 1977, Via Rail became a separate crown corporation and took over the services, locomotives, and rail cars of CN's former passenger rail service. Later, on October 29, 1978, VIA took over CP's passenger rail service and acquired CP's passenger rail rolling stock. However, VIA Rail did not own any tracks and had to pay CN and CP to use their tracks. This continues to this day, and VIA trains often have to yield to slower moving freight trains, causing abysmal on time ratings. Throughout the years, VIA's service was cut back, leaving only a small framework of routes, mostly focused on the Quebec City Windsor Corridor. Canada does not have any high-speed rail, and is the only G7 country to not have any. However, there were several unsuccessful attempts to create high-speed rail in Canada, namely the UAC Turbo Train and the LRC. The Turbo Train was a gas turbine-powered train manufactured by the United Aircraft Corporation. It was marketed as a futuristic way to travel at the time, as seen in this old timetable. It had a design speed of 170 miles per hour, but was limited to 95 miles per hour in regular passenger service due to the track condition and the numerous grade crossings along the Kingston sub between Toronto and Montreal. It was also plagued by many technical difficulties. The turbo train was succeeded by the LRC, which stood for light, rapid, comfortable in English, or léger, rapide et confortable in French. The LRC was built by Bombardier and consisted of matching diesel-electric locomotives and passenger cars. The trains could achieve a speed of up to 125 miles per hour on regular tracks through the use of active tilting technology, which tilts the train as it rounds a curve to reduce the centrifugal force felt by the riders. However, the LRC initially had many problems, one of which was that the cars would stay locked in a tilted position even after a turn had been completed and the track had straightened out from a curve. Additionally, the LRC was limited to speeds of less than 100 miles per hour due to track conditions and conflicts with slower moving freight trains. The LRC passenger cars are still in service today, albeit hauled with regular diesel electric locomotives and with the tilting function disabled. On the other hand, short distance regional rail service in the Greater Toronto and Hamilton area has grown significantly. Since its founding in 1967, Go Transit has grown to operate several regional rail lines across the Golden Horseshoe. Many Go Train stations are fairly car oriented, with large parking garages and a location next to major highway interchanges. Go Transit stands for Government of Ontario Transit. The iconic octagonal bi-level coaches that travel across a network today were originally developed by Go Transit and Hawker Siddeley Canada and originated in 1976. Go originally consisted of a single lakeshore line that ran from Oakville in the west to Pickering in the east, with rush hour service to Hamilton. Today, Go's network consists of the lakeshore west, Milton, Kitchener, Barrie, Richmond Hill, Stouffville, and lakeshore east lines, seven lines in total.
Although the history of passenger rail transport in Canada is rather disappointing, the future might still be bright. On one hand, Via Rail is proposing what it calls High Frequency Rail, or HFR, a plan to improve its service frequency and increase the number of departures per day, while greatly improving its on-time performance by building dedicated tracks. On the other hand, in the Greater Toronto and Hamilton area, GO is proposing what it calls GO Expansion, or Regional Express Rail. It would see GO trains running across the Golden Horseshoe at frequencies as often as 15 minutes and most of the network electrified. With the ever-increasing fuel prices and a shift to urbanization, taking the train might just be in style again. But time will tell if the coronavirus pandemic was the death knell for trains and public transit, as the pandemic has caused ridership on all railway and transit systems in Canada to plummet and has led to the death of motor coach operator Greyhound. It has also it led to an increase in cycling. But after the pandemic over, the future is still bright for the railways in Canada. In conclusion, railways had a great impact on Canadian civilization as we know it today. The railway brought civilizations throughout the land and made the Canadian economy prosperous by transporting goods around the country. And here's the decades more of working on the railroad all the live long day.